Kosh existed in a vast sea of nothingness, and he spent so much time in this isolation that one day he broke down in tears. Seeing that his tears had fallen and created an ocean, Kosh sighed in relief, recognized his power, and went on to create many features of the earth, like the sun and the land. The people who first populated Argentina arrived thousands of years before the glaciers receded enough to allow the Burring Strait to be crossed by the Clovis people. As research on pre-Clovis human migration into the Americas is still fairly new, there have yet to be many solid conclusions made as to their migration patterns. However, the current prevailing theory, as most pre-Clovis sites appear near water, is that island hoppers from the Pacific arrived and settled along the coast of South America. People would begin Stone Age nomadic foraging lives in southern Argentina, and they would sometimes hunt megafauna, from giant ground sloths to mammoths. But the primary source of meat was smaller animals, like the small South American horse. It is theorized that these people began establishing semi-permanent settlements due to climatic changes that made the weather less volatile. The oldest of these pre-Clovis settlements that we currently know of in Argentina being Arroyo Seco II, a seasonal hunting and processing camp, Despite the general temperature of southern Argentina, also known as Patagonia, becoming more mild, the weather was nonetheless harsh, which means that in these early years of human settlement, humans were mostly in small groups and scattered. As the spread of humans through Patagonia occurred over a wide area, the indigenous people of Argentina exploded into many smaller groups, with distinct languages and cultural practices. But Patagonia is not the only land of Argentina. The modern borders of the nation cover many diverse biomes and regions. So, as they settled around Argentina, people specialized their lives according to their surroundings. Those that settled in the Tierra del Fuego region lived a maritime life. Since vegetation was very limited, they turned to the sea to provide for their needs. Northwards, the indigenous people for quite a while lived very similar lives to those in Patagonia, but certain features of the north allowed them to change their hunter-gatherer lifestyles. Both the fertile soil and the easier access to trade allowed these people to domesticate crops and promoted a sedentary lifestyle. From this, we see the Vaquerias culture emerge, with ceramics being fabricated and camelids that were introduced to the region being domesticated. These people eventually began working with metals like copper or tin, and as they were some of the first to do so in the region, they were very important in the development of metallurgy in South America. Fortunately, northern Argentina is abundant in copper, and in the ancient world, this region was considered a very important source of the metal. Other areas of northern Argentina saw the rise of skilled craftsmen and sculptors, as trade caravans began passing through the region, trade itself becoming increasingly important to the ancient peoples. Meanwhile, Brazilian subsistence farmers, known as the Guarani, settled in the Rio de la Plata region, centralizing around the river. Soon, northwest Argentina saw the rise of the Condorwasi and Cienega culture, from the Vaquerias culture. This period saw the rapid growth of villages and an increase in the number of settlements in northwestern Argentina. It is thought that the two cultures began to clash due to an increased presence of infants in cemeteries and rapid expansion. And from this violence, the Cienega had become the predominant culture of the region, where they greatly improved their metalworking skills. Not only were the Cienega famous for their beautiful ornamental axes, but they also were introduced to bronze. Slowly the Cienega would give way to the Aguada culture, as agricultural technology advanced enough for surpluses to be achieved. This allowed for an explosion in art, particularly in pottery. Aguada people also saw a revolution in hierarchies, since now that there were surpluses, someone owned that surplus. In the Aguada culture, those with surplus attained a lord status, which previously was impossible. In spite of its economic success, the Aguada saw rapid depopulation at the end of its lifetime, which has been attributed to environmental forces, mainly fires and droughts. A power gap was left in the wake of the depopulation, which was filled by many regional groups, but predominantly the Diaguita people from northern Chile. In Argentina, the Calchaquí people emerged as a subgroup of the Diaguita as they adopted to their new environments. These people were skilled artisans and created elaborate ceramics used in both daily and ritualistic life. Their daily life was much less hierarchical than their predecessors in the region, with an increased focus on communal living. The valleys that they inhabited were very desirable and politically fragmented, so the people that lived there experienced frequent conflict and struggles to defend their territory. So the Kalchaki people were forced to become highly militarized, erecting numerous fortifications and outposts. 
This did nothing, however, in the face of the Inca, who in their expansion southwards, saw the valleys fruitful and rich in materials, and wanted the land as part of their empire. As there was no overarching political structure, people of northern Argentina stood no chance to form a reasonable resistance against the tens of thousands of troops of the Inca. Knowing that they greatly outnumbered the locals, the Inca avoided battle as much as possible, instead offering an option of peaceful subjugation. In the region, the Calchaquí gave the most stiff resistance, but elsewhere, the trend was usually giving in to Inca domination without a struggle. Finally, after minimal conflict, the region was more or less secured, and was incorporated into the Cuyasuyu, or South Province of the Inca Empire. What followed was a period of great societal and technological upheaval for the Argentinian people, as they were introduced to the trade routes of the Inca, and their organized, centralized state. Argentinians were introduced to a form of governing that they had never known before, with taxes, a government that spanned more than one settlement, and a strict, rigid hierarchy. Under this hierarchy, the native people were treated as second-class citizens, while they were resettled to other parts of the empire, and Inca populations settled en masse in Argentina. As a result, there began a swift cultural shift, since the closer to Inca you were both culturally and religiously, the higher up the social ladder you could climb. Native ways of life often faded into Inca practices. Eastward, foreign eyes fell upon Argentina, as the expeditions of Américo Vespucci and Juan Díaz de Solís scouted the Rio de la Plata estuary and Patagonian coast. These early explorers of Argentina heard tales from locals of a river leading to a land of endless silver, and brought these stories back to Europe where they captured the imagination of future explorers. One such explorer, Ferdinand Magellan, on a quest to find a route to the Spice Islands, sailed into the Rio de la Plata estuary, hoping that it would lead to the Pacific, but winter conditions forced his party out. Argentina presented Magellan with his first major impasse on his journey, as it was the first uncharted territory he had to explore, and it possibly held the fabled path to the Pacific many Europeans craved. Here he landed to rest his men, and repair his ships for a time, and named the place Bahia de los Patos, due to the number of penguins around. Several more short stops would be made along the coast, as the ships were battered by winter storms, but none of these landings would introduce the Tushin people to the Spaniards. The winter would once again force a pause, and this time, Magellan decided to wait until conditions calmed down to set off again. However, as they were currently in the Patagonian desert, there was not much to do but sulk in the cold and wait for time to pass. As the crew continued wintering, they began spotting fires inland, which some of the crew were sent to approach. Here was a small camp of Taoshin people, who met the Europeans kindly, and traded eagerly. For Magellan, this was not enough, and when the crew arrived with their goods back to the ships, Magellan demanded that they go back and capture a Taoshin man. As native people of this region were nomadic, the camp had already gone by the time the Europeans returned, which forced them to track down the Taoshin through the winter cold. At the second camp the native people established, the Europeans tried to capture one of them, but the Taoshin were able to escape and injure one of the foreigners. Magellan would call these people Patagon, meaning big feet, as the leather shoes the Taoshin wore made their feet look huge. And this is where Patagonia derives its name, Land of the Patagon. For the rest of their stay here, the Europeans never saw these natives again. They did, however, claim the lands for the King of Spain, naming the bay where they were, Puerto San Julian. Magellan also claimed Rio Santa Cruz, as he wintered there as well, because it offered more protection and had much easier access to wood. Eventually, the Europeans would be off again, and the Argentine hurdle successfully jumped, as they made their way through the Magellan Strait and into the Pacific, with stories to tell about giant men singing and dancing in the Patagonian sand. The prospect that the Rio de la Plata estuary was a gateway to a fabled land of silver intrigued Sebastian Caboto, who sailed into the area on a journey that was officially to reach Asia. His hopes of riches can be seen in the name that he gave the land once he arrived, Terra Argentina, meaning land of silver in Latin. Afterwards, he swiftly sailed up the Rio de la Plata. Upon this journey, Caboto built a fort along the river, which he called Sancti Spiritu, and marks the first European settlement on Argentinian land. Initially, the journey was smooth, with friendly Guarani people aiding them with hunting, but the further down the river Caboto and his men went, the more their true colors showed. 
Their Guarani guides eventually went home, and the Europeans began treating the natives they came across with exceptional cruelty, while indiscriminately slaughtering any animals they came by, for food was scarce. This put the Europeans in direct competition with local tribes, who lashed out in return. These conditions, and the treacherous, unpredictable river system, forced Caboto to retreat without finding his precious silver, and after, Sancti Spiritu was attacked and destroyed by a native army. European influence was also felt in northwest Argentina, with a plague crawling along trade routes into the land. It is unknown how much European diseases affected native populations there, especially as Argentina was on the periphery of the Inca Empire, but it is safe to assume that it killed significant numbers of people. Along these same routes, news came to the Diaguita people of pale-skinned pirates who could only be satisfied with gold. Yet even once Argentina had been stripped of Inca artifacts, they heard that these pirates had killed their ruler, and that they were not just here for gold, but to conquer land as well. Before they knew it, the conquistador Diego del Magro was searching to further his own prestige in Cuyasuyu by claiming the lands as part of his government of New Toledo and searching for lost Inca treasures. The collapse of the Inca Empire most likely didn't cause much turmoil in Argentina, since as Diego passed through with his posse of Spanish soldiers and Inca nobles upon Inca roads, they encountered no resistance from local people. Argentina was mostly able to stay beyond the administrative reach of the Spaniards, as the land did not hold the riches that the empire desired. At the same time, the Spanish king had been motivated by the legends of riches and by competition with the Portuguese into claiming much of South America, according to the Treaty of Tordesillas. These claims came with a division of this land, with Pedro de Mendoza being given the land of Nueva Andalusia, and Simón de El Cazaba was granted Nuevo León. Both of these colonies took up most of Argentina. Both men attempted to settle their land, both failing horribly. But, Pedro was able to found the city Nuestra Señora Santa Maria del Buen Ayer, later to be named Buenos Aires, which laid the foundations for future colonization efforts. What the brief settlers of Buenos Aires didn't know is that they fundamentally changed the lives of many native people, as when they fled the colony, they released their horses and cattle, which flourished throughout Argentina. Many Native American tribes adopted horse riding very quickly, and became extremely skilled cavalry. Despite Argentina holding no official Spanish settlements anymore, and Spain having no governance over the land, Argentina was still considered part of the Viceroyalty of Peru. Colonial expansion was in full swing in the Andes, though, and from this, colonial administration needed to be established. So, as stories permeated Peru of the lost treasures deep in Argentina, and in trying to formally extend the reach of the Viceroyalty through its claimed territory, Diego de Rojas was tasked with leading an expedition into northwestern Argentina. Rojas attacked native populations as the expedition marched through Argentina, so natives resisted their advance. They were able to kill Rojas, but his torch was taken up by Francisco de Mendoza. This man was less violent, but still fought with many people upon his journey deep into the country, including the Calchaquí. Upon this tiresome journey, he found the ruins of Sancti Spiritu, the fort that Sebastian Caboto had failed to maintain. Mendoza wanted to reach Asuncion in Paraguay, as he was traveling by river, but the expedition had to be turned around due to low morale and poor river conditions. European colonization attempts had lasting effects upon the native population, since the people of Argentina fell further prey to European diseases, and the Mapuche, who were being constantly attacked by the Spanish, extended their influence and presence eastward. Many Mapuche resettled in Patagonia or the Pampas to flee Spanish influence and brutal treatment. They also conducted extensive trading in this direction, since they had lost their trade partners to the north. Meanwhile, Geronimo Luis de Cabrera was sent on an expedition to settle the province of Tucumán, in doing so, being named its governor. But Cabrera was more motivated by the prospect of glory in finding the fabulously rich city of Césars. So, after establishing Cordoba, he went in search of this lost city, and on the way, encountering Juan de Garay, the governor of Rio de la Plata. Juan de Garay had just established his own town, Santa Fe, in search of the same riches. While Cabrera was gone on his treasure hunt, a rival had risen to power in Santiago del Estero, the capital of the province, and had sent for Cabrera on his expedition. The rival governor had the explorer executed for not following the king's directions of settling Tucumán. In the wake of this, and a serious illness taking hold of him, 
Juan de Garay decided to flee to his capital, and the governor turned his attention to the resettlement of Buenos Aires. The city would be able to link Asuncion to Spain by way of river, which was a much easier and faster way to transport the raw materials of the colony than over land routes. With dozens of families from Asuncion, Garay established a permanent settlement of the abandoned city, but Buenos Aires floundered in its growth due to native resistance and restrictive trade policies of the Spanish Empire. Eastern coastal progress generally struggled, as Spanish laws restricted all trade to the port of Lima in Peru, but the settlers of Buenos Aires carried on despite all this. All the while, northwestern cities experienced modest growth, coming from the building of the University of Cordoba, the region supporting Bolivia by being a large food supplier, and since the region was a trade connection between Bolivia and Peru. European presence in the Northwest meant that they brought more foreign diseases, massacred indigenous people, and forced many into slavery to work grueling jobs. Jesuits also spread through Argentina in attempts to civilize the indigenous people. In the face of this horrid colonial life, many indigenous people looked upon the times of the Inca with fondness, and many began to identify with the Inca, leading to a greater sense of unity between the different indigenous groups. The Calchaquí in particular proved to be a thorn in the side of the Spanish, as they fiercely resisted colonial endeavors by defeating Spanish soldiers and raising their settlements in the region. Though in their resistance, many Calchaquí soldiers were captured and forced into slavery, and their leaders were killed by the Spanish. This is when Pedro Borges, fleeing from Spanish authorities, came to the Calchaquí and announced himself as the sole living heir of Inca royalty, named Inca Hualpa, who had come to them in hopes to resist the Spanish. At the same time, he told the Spanish he was trying to subjugate these people and find a secret hoard of Inca treasures, and telling the Jesuits of the land that he was hoping to convert the Calchaquí. All the while, he began fortifying the land and amassing a huge army, which was easy as refugees flooded into the Calchaquí valleys, being united by this Inca resisting the Spanish. Obviously, the Spanish recognized this insubordination and moved an army against Borges, who immediately pleaded for forgiveness and gave himself in. But he had already set the wheels in motion for rebellion. In his wake, Jose Quilmes took up the torch of native resistance. But nothing could stop the advance of the modern Spanish army, who systematically destroyed indigenous towns and afterwards killed, enslaved, or displaced every indigenous person in the Calchaquí valleys. At this point, native resistance was negligible and Northwest Argentina was a land free for settlement and expansion of Spanish rule. Settlers of Argentina were, however, becoming increasingly discontent with their rulers, as the eastern cities continued to suffer under the restrictive trade policies of the Spanish, and so turned to illegally trading with the Portuguese and British through Buenos Aires. Spanish claims were also being challenged in the east, as the Portuguese expanded colonies southward, and the British had sent settlers to the Falkland Islands. After forcing the British from the Falkland Islands and starting a war with Portugal, the Spanish crown established the Viceroyalty of Rio de la Plata, encompassing Argentina, Bolivia, and Paraguay. This meant that most trade from these regions was now to be funneled through Buenos Aires, and after Spain cemented its colonial borders with Portugal, the city exploded in population. Viceroys of Rio de la Plata went on to reconstruct the government and improve the lives of their subjects through infrastructure development while expanding the trade capabilities of the Viceroyalty through policy and promotion of farming. The Pampas are flat, expansive fields that stretch through northern Argentina, which make the perfect land for grazing cattle and European agriculture. So, especially with government promotion, the Pampas were quickly settled and grain and cow products became the main exported goods from Buenos Aires. Even Patagonia saw its first permanent settlements under this new government, with Patagonia being famously difficult to colonize due to a lack of available resources. In support of their ally France, Spain declared war on England, and the Viceroyalty of Buenos Aires was wildly unprepared and left to their own devices against an English invasion. Militias were left purposefully undertrained, as rulers feared arming a population who increasingly supported the revolutionary ideas of the recent French and American revolutions. The Viceroy, alongside many powerful Spanish elites, chose to flee from British troops, causing the fall of Buenos Aires. Santiago de Liñez rose as a prominent and popular figure after he defeated two British invasion forces with an army of Argentinians. 
He was appointed the governor of the Viceroyalty by a local court, a decision which had never been made before. The fact that the people of the Viceroyalty defended themselves without the aid from the Spanish crown, local Spanish representatives and merchants abandoned the people during the invasion, and the people had appointed their own ruler, proved to the colony that they no longer had use for the Spanish. The stage was set in the Rio de la Plata, as, in Spain, the Supreme Central Junta was established, which claimed sovereignty over the colonies of the Spanish king, and Napoleon invaded. Once this junta was dissolved in the wake of military defeats, and the French took Seville, Argentinians took the opportunity to rebel. Some of the great political minds of the colony had come together, and proposed that the current viceroy was no longer a valid ruler, as the government that had appointed him was dissolved. This idea garnered enough support that they were able to pressure the viceroy into ceding power to Argentinians, and the Primera Junta was established as Argentina's first independent government. The rebellion was not so easy though, as factions within the government were very divided between wealthy individuals who benefited from a Spanish power structure and criollos who made up most of the population and wanted more representation. A moderate solution was agreed upon, which proposed that this was an interim government until a Spanish monarch returned to the throne. Meanwhile, royalists or those that did not recognize the authority of the Primera Junta resisted in Cordoba, Upper Peru, Asuncion, Montevideo, and Chile. To start, the junta dispersed the royalist army from Cordoba, while other Argentine provinces accepted the government of Buenos Aires. These provinces bolstered the army's manpower, as many cities organized militias. This bolstered army was sent to Asuncion to regain the province, but suffered heavy losses and ended ultimately with an armistice. And after this campaign, Buenos Aires sent a contingent of troops to support rebels in Montevideo. At the same time, troops were sent north to confront royalists in Upper Peru. By this time, though, Upper Peru had submitted to the Viceroyalty of Peru to help them resist incoming Argentine attacks. There was initial success, with Upper Peru falling to the Junta. The plan was to advance into Peru and liberate it as well, but the army was decimated at Waki and lost valuable equipment and manpower. The army retreated to Jujuy, and because Buenos Aires was now at risk from invasion from the north, the government was forced to sign a ceasefire with the royalists in Montevideo. These defeats caused a lack of confidence in the government, and consequently, rulers several times restructured the government. Also, the Spanish Lieutenant José de San Martín arrived in Buenos Aires, defecting and offering his extensive military knowledge to the government. San Martín would be instrumental in the training of the Argentine military, and would prove his worth enough to be assigned to lead the Northern Army against ongoing attacks from the Royalists. From here, San Martin would go on to liberate many South American lands. Soon, the king had returned to the throne of Spain, which put Rio de la Plata in a strange situation, since the government was technically only ruling in absence of the king. While this allowed for the government to declare independence and officially rid the nation of Spanish power structures, it destroyed the weak alliance of groups holding the government together, and a chaotic, violent struggle for power ensued, dubbed the Anarchy of the Years XX. Many individual warlords called caudillos vied for power, but the main divide found was between Unitarians, who wanted a strong centralized government based around Buenos Aires, and Federalists, who wanted to become a federation with loose government control. In the midst of these civil wars, coups, and usurpings, Rio de la Plata entered a war with independent Brazil over Montevideo. Though seeing early success and acting as a unifying force for Argentina, the war eventually ground to a stalemate that led to a very unpopular peace which renounced Argentine claims to Uruguay. The government had also heavily leaned Unitarian during the war, so once peace was reached, the chaotic civil war returned. Power this time was taken by Juan Manuel de Rosas, a Federalist, who assumed dictatorial powers to stabilize the country. His rule saw a civil war against the Unitary League, a war alongside Chile that dissolved the Peru-Bolivian Confederation, and an expansion southward into native land. Rosas overall wanted stability, and would go to any lengths to achieve that. He burnt critical writings of his regime, brutally killed Unitarians, and established a paramilitary force with unlimited power to destroy any opposition. Through this, Rosas, who was initially fairly popular, made many enemies, both internally and externally. Rosas only made his position worse by involvement in the Uruguayan Civil War. Europeans hated this war already, as it interfered with their trade interests, 
So, when Rosas decided to blockade the Rio de la Plata River due to Paraguay's entrance into the war, the French and British blockaded Buenos Aires. Argentina still had a colonial economy, which was focused on the export of raw goods and the import of manufactured goods. So, this blockade devastated Argentina and forced them into a peace deal with England. The resulting economic turmoil made many people unite their allegiances to a caudillo, Justo José de Urquiza, who with his popularity became allied to several other caudillos, Uruguay and Brazil. This coalition attacked Rosas, overthrew him, and installed Urquiza. Urquiza knew the tightrope he had to balance on to keep his base happy, so he turned to the provinces, and with them, created a new constitution based on the American constitution. Because this was very federalist, it hurt the power of Buenos Aires. So, the province refused to participate in this new Argentine confederation, and thus revolted. Urquiza knew that this would happen, and the constitution that was made had Buenos Aires in mind, and set the foundations of Argentina as a unified state, with provinces having their own governments beneath the restricted power of Buenos Aires. The next battle was uniting the country under this constitution, where Urquiza attempted to avoid conflict at all costs. So, when his army arrived at Buenos Aires, rather than lay siege, he opened negotiations that led to Buenos Aires joining the Argentine Confederation. Public works projects and government programs were now developed. Public schooling, transitioning to paper money, liberal markets, and the decentralization of government power were faces of this new era of government. Once internal stability was established, immigration exploded in Argentina. Europeans invested in colonial projects, and government assistance was offered to those who wanted to settle in Argentina. These efforts of developing their nation were hampered, though, by Paraguay declaring war on Argentina over historical claims, and because Argentina refused Paraguayan soldiers' passage through Argentina. The public widely supported the war, but still, the professional army of Paraguay allowed them to raid the north, and beat Argentina in battle several times. Eventually, the tides turned, and the Triple Alliance defeated Paraguay. Previous nation-building efforts immediately resumed in full swing. Quality of life exploded as modern technologies flowed into the nation, and many immigrants, largely from Italy, Wales, Spain, and Germany arrived. This caused tension with Patagonian Native Americans, who opposed the encroachment of settlers onto their lands, these native people would conduct raids upon settlements to discourage further advances and to regain their land. The conquest of the desert was declared by the Minister of War, General Julio Argentino de Roca. He used native raids as an excuse to destroy the Native American presence in Patagonia and the Gran Chaco. His systematic and unwavering campaign against the native tribes garnered Roca wide popularity, and he was elected president of Argentina, where he would finish the last holdout of native resistance. Due to the incoming wealth from recent economic developments, many oligarchs arose, forming the National Autonomist Party. These men had enough power to guarantee themselves political domination in every election. They implemented policies that expanded their wealth at the cost of the common folk. Workers lived in horrendous conditions, while Argentina was considered one of the richest countries on earth. Frustrations with this system were exacerbated by a financial crash due to the extensive loans of the oligarchs. Many political parties were formed, representing the vast middle class, and a workers' revolt ensued. When the revolt was defeated, it was only used to further cement the political power of the oligarchs, who prospered from a continued growth of the economy. Radical ideologies began to take hold, like socialism and anarchism, and civil unrest continued, frequently becoming violent. The economic deprivation of the lower classes continued to spiral out of control, with reduction in trade from the hostilities of World War I, and the populace was only more angry. In the face of massive protests, concessions were able to be made in the passing of the Science Peña laws, which allowed for universal male suffrage and a secret ballot. The United Radical Party, which had risen in the protests, dominated the political scene with a series of presidents. These radical presidents weren't as radical as they sound, having turned to conservative ideals to garner more support. And once again, the oligarchs were able to slip their influence into politics through them. Feeling continuously ignored and inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution, the people once again rose up, even in the face of harsher and harsher government responses. Argentinians couldn't catch a break as the Great Depression ravaged the country and many were forced deeper into poverty. 
Disenchanted with the state of his country, General José Félix Uriburu led a military coup where he hoped to emulate the fascist government of Mussolini. In adopting these ideals, Uriburu renounced the constitution, giving himself and a group of military officials unrestricted power. These military officials were very divided in who to support with the outbreak of the Second World War. While there were many immigrants from Axis nations, and the military largely supported Axis powers, the relative power of the Allies was feared. There was also a large enough population of Jews in the nation that they had to be considered as well in policy decisions. Neutrality was the official word of the government, but they were tempted by the opportunity to take the repopulated Falkland Islands from the British. The plan was abandoned after a reassessment. Tides turned when the United States joined the war, because they expected the support of South American nations in the Allied war effort. Under this pressure, a supporter of the Allies was proclaimed to be the successor of the presidency, which sparked a military coup from a group who feared the entrance of Argentina into the war alongside the Allies. Immediate factionalism followed, and many more military coups around the way. Internationally, the Argentinians were largely trading with the Allies, but not committing their army to the war effort. Thus, the nation was accused of Nazi sympathies, and the United States began to formulate an invasion plan of Argentina. The plan never went into effect because of the collapse of the Axis European theater, and Argentina, seeing the writing on the wall, gave up their Axis leanings and joined the war against Japan, never declaring war on Germany directly though. The end of the war saw many Nazi officials fleeing along rat lines to Argentina, and the government welcomed them openly for their various skills. During the war, Juan Perón was appointed Secretary of Labor and Welfare, and from this position, the military official built government programs, which exploded his popularity. Perón used the power of the people to garner a base strong enough to gain him the presidency. He immediately supported the workers by raising minimum wage, improving infrastructure, instituting women's suffrage, and expanding public programs. Although, Perón also had authoritarian tendencies that isolated him from his allies, and inflation reduced trade, leading to an inability to keep up with the expenses of the government's various industries. Perón pushed to take further control of the state in response, alienating a vital source of his support. Eventually, a military coup took over that plunged Argentina into another series of factional civil conflicts, economic crises, uprisings, and tyrannical governments. In the Northwest, far-left insurgents continually fought a guerrilla war with the government, which got the attention of the United States, who liked a nation that was attacking communists. And so, Argentine dictators began receiving US funding. One of these regimes particularly infringed upon civil rights. Jorge Rafael Videla burned books in efforts to institute a tight censorship campaign. His regime used death squads to abduct tens of thousands of civilians and kill torture and or imprison them. As a result of the low public opinion of the military junta, infighting deposed Videla, but stability was not regained. In order to unite the populace behind a cause, and hopefully establish a stable government, Leopoldo Galtieri aimed for a swift victory against Britain in the Falkland Islands that would drum up national pride. Due to a carefully crafted narrative, the government was able to gain the internal unity that it desired, framing the invasion as anti-imperialist. While once their troops had secured the islands, they reinforced their positions, preparing for a British attack. The ensuing invasion garnered the ire of most nations, and Argentina was easily labeled a villain. This was an unexpected turn of events for Galtieri, who expected more Second World support. The narrative crumbled as news of British destruction of the Argentine army arrived, and many took to the streets to demonstrate against the government. Enough pressure was built from these protests that Galtieri's successor began the transition back to a civilian-led democracy. After some establishing political and economic stability, Argentina was able to reduce national debt by 75% through restructuring, and it was the first South American nation to legalize same-sex marriage. Argentina began another clamor over its claims to the Falkland Islands, but a vote unfortunately showed that the residents were unanimously loyal to the British. A steady improvement of the Argentine economy was halted by high inflation, and the aforementioned restructuring of the loans not going as planned, which forced Argentina to default on these loans, followed by a recession. Subsequent leaders battled with the inflation crisis and the economic crisis, trying in many ways to solve it. However, the COVID pandemic ensured that any progress was lost. The government did respond quickly by implementing restrictions and improving social spending. but. 
It was also involved in scandals involving corruption and misuse of public funds. Meanwhile, forming from a lack of Western trust, Chinese influence grew in Argentina, to the extent that they became the nation's largest trade partner for a time. And Argentina signed on the Belt and Road Initiative. And that was the state of the nation of Argentina. Please like and subscribe if you liked the video. And if you have any suggestions or comments, leave them in the comment section below or email me with my email in the description. I also started a Patreon if anyone is interested in supporting a small creator like myself. Thank you.